Now you have heard about the basics of little bit of remote sensing and sensors and platforms. No? So let, let us try to uh, see how these uh, sensors are useful to us. Uh, particularly uh, what I have done, I have tried to focus more on the your requirement because biodiversity when you talk about there are many applications and your focus will be probably uh, to tag all these let us say economically, medicinally and uh, uh, whatever the importance they have because uh, those who are below ground, uh, sorry below canopy it will be very difficult for to map using remote sensing data. So let us uh, see how best we can do it. Uh, so, I have modified the talk like the geospatial tools for biodiversity characterization that is one part and then how to generate knowledge database because your objective will be in I use to generate a knowledge database uh, on the medicinal or economical or aromatic plants. Let us say everything uh, part of this I have put in here. How you can create that database, how it can be updated from different centers. You have so many agencies working on the same thing. So, we can think about that, that you have a, let us say target about next 5 years or 6 years, you generate the database on, on this. We have something here in IRS, uh, but um, your requirement probably will be different, so we would like to. Uh, let us try to understand few of the terms, I know some of you are botanists here, but still there are some engineer settings, so I thought let me put the, what is the definition of biodiversity. Uh, very simple definition I have put in here, it is basically variability of the living organisms. So, anything which is living, we can see the variability, that means bio means living, diversity means the variability. So, all the variability of the living organisms, we call it biodiversity. It can be at genetic level, that means variability in the genes. Uh, it can be at the specific level, you have a species, subspecies, varieties, subvarieties, forma, races, you know, there is a huge uh, nomenclature system is there. And even at uh, landscape and ecosystem level, within a landscape you will have several ecosystems, within an ecosystem you have several populations, so that also is a kind of a diversity. So all that together we call it as a biodiversity. Now second term is the characterization. Characterization basically, see we have around 23 and a half percent of the total forest let us say uh, in, the, in India uh, which is reported by FSI and around 4.8 or 5.8 percent of the total geographical area is now covered as a protected area, protected area and in, in the form of national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, community forests, all that. Uh, still that means around uh, let us say good forest around is around 11 percent, high density forest is around 11 percent, out of that let us say we have around half or less than half is conserved. That means there is still potential to have more protected area network or an extended protected area network. For that we need to characterize, that means we need to classify, we need to categorize the habitats, prioritize the habitats, ecosystems, landscapes or biomes. Uh, these we have to prioritize, okay, this ecosystem is not represented, let us put protect it or let us say this biome is not protected, let us protect it. So that kind of categorization for or let us say prioritization basically, among all that 11 or 12 percent dense forest what we have, that is the characterization. How remote sensing can help us, that I will be discussing about. Uh, let us link to the medicinal plants for which you are here and they are found in all kinds of habitats. Uh, she has told in the previous, I, could list, I was listening to some of the very high resolution uh, sensors are there and they have a very good potential very good potential for mapping habitats. So you can map, if you have a little coarser resolution or medium resolution, you can do the forest type. If you have a little better, you can go up to habitats, ecosystem, communities. So if you can identify a community, that means you have done a lot of work actually because community we know what kind of plants or animals are found. So then I can link it to the my own objective. So let us say they are found in terrestrial, aquatic, they may be epiphytic, lithophytic, you know all, all kinds of or maybe parasitic. There are many plants which you grow on other plants, so they also have a habitat of parasitic. So all this we will be uh, are trying to touch upon, let us see how. Uh, I just would like to say here, uh, uh, lower three points if you look to see, uh, what we are talking is the traditional knowledge, see all that I use or uh, whatever knowledge we have on the plants, 
is based on the experience of let us say thousands and thousands of year who have been practicing the uh, let us say Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani and all that kind of medicine systems. Therefore, uh, we have to find out a kind of a repository uh, where all kinds of uh, things are available and then uh, like you will talk about the uh, copyright or people talk about the what you call that uh, when you have something new, new thing patents. Yeah? So, if you have recorded everything then you have an evidence you know it is already recorded in our literature. So, it is our right, it is our patent, you cannot do it like Haldi or Neem or whatever you use. Because everybody knows Haldi is very good, it is antiseptic, but nowhere it is recorded. So, that kind of recording registers or whatever you should have and then we can claim. So, that is a very important uh, uh, aspect of it. Now, when you talk about the biodiversity of natural ecosystems, uh, because we have to develop a base which uh, should have a socio-cultural aspect. Because uh, many plants he has worked in let us say in Arunachal Pradesh and I am sure many plants which are used by people living in Sikkim, same plant is also found in Arunachal Pradesh, but they do not know how to use it. There are many plants, there are many plants which are occurring in Arunachal Pradesh also in Sikkim also. Sikkim people know how to use it, but Arunachal Pradesh people do not know how to use it. So, that means that knowledge base has to be enhanced and enriched and that is only possible if you use little modern tools. Uh, let us think about the uh, plants which are occurring let us say in your naturopathy, yoga or uh, Ayurvedic system or Unani system of uh, medicines. Uh, what we are interested is the occurrence, where they are found. Basically that is the objective of uh, and how do we know? Because those plants which are cultivated we have no issue. But most of the plants which are let us say maybe 60 or 70 percent or maybe 80 percent they are collected from the wild. So, very, very small percent you can say is being cultivated maybe in some areas, but majority it comes from the wild. So, that means in wild also yesterday also I was telling when we were during the inaugural that very few species grow gregariously that means large, large patches. Otherwise, most of the plants have grow scattered. You find one plant here, maybe another plant after 10 meters or 20 meters like that. So, that means the, uh, the, the diversity in terms of the distribution, diversity in terms of the habitat, diversity in terms of the habit system, let us say maybe shrub or herb or climber or a tree, it varies a lot. Similarly, the remote sensing data also varies a lot. So, it is very important that we need to synchronize with what data, what is possible, what is not possible. And where it, something is not possible, we have the ground truth. So, biggest advantage we have, we can go to the field, we can, we have a GPS nowadays and you can carry high, very high resolution satellite images and then you can try to locate. At least GPS locations, you can, if you can get it within the accuracy of 5 meters, that is a good enough actually. Uh, yesterday also I said that, that uh, very few uh, wild species, let us say, uh, grow gregariously. I have given some examples just for your knowledge, let us say Quercus, what is Semicarpi folia or Floribunda or, or any other species you can find them in big, big patches. So, if I have to map this thing and below Quercus or Quercus itself can be useful, if something is there I can relate it. Similarly, Surya robusta, Acacia catechu, Atathoda vesca, Atathoda is very uh, useful plant. Similarly, Hippophy, yesterday somebody was working, somebody has done here. So, Hippophy, let us say we have four, five species, uh, Hippophy rhamnoides or Hippophy tibetica, tibetina or tibetica, tibetana. So, we have some species. Ephedra, Ephedra also grows in the Lahuli Spiti as well as in the Leh, that area is also found in the uh, desert, hot desert, that is in the Rajasthan. So, everywhere it is only mentioned that it is found in Kashmir. Ha, no, no, but it, it is, no, 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 I know, no, I think we should, uh, you, you should publish if it is not, because we have already reported it in our reports, because we have done a study called biodiversity characterization uh, for the entire country and there we have already reported all this, because we have done sampling and in our sample we have found that uh, ephedra is also growing in the hot desert, he is wildly, I will show you some pictures also. Similarly, Texas Walishana, in western Himalayas we have uh, a scattered population. That means uh, trees are not very, uh, you know, very dense. Whereas if you go to Arunachal Pradesh, if you go to Tale Valley, you have only Texas Baketa or Valichana water. You can see about 80 percent pure population of Texas is found, and that means I can map it. 
see if you go to western Himalaya, you find one tree here and after maybe 30, 40 meters or maybe 100 meters you find another tree, you can't map it actually. Therefore, it is very difficult. Barberis also grows very, Ephedra also grows very, uh, this uh, uh, Holarina, what you call the antidacentric eyes now pubescence. Uh, Holarina is very important plant that also grows gregariously actually. Uh, Nictanthus, uh, wherever this clearing has been done, you will find very nice growth of this Nictanthus uh, is there. So, you can map that actually. Uh, at the same time, there are many, many, I think this is only maybe 1 or 2 percent of the medicine plants which you can map. Most of other plants are either grown or found mixed with other species. So, there, that means I need to do more field work. So, that is important and that, uh, that is what I have written here. Most of the plants, herbs, climbers, shrubs, they are in the bottom story. You do not get it in top story, you do not get these on the, uh, let us say, first story, second story, you get in bottom only. So, bottom means the reflectance is from the top, canopy, not from the soldiers or from board. So, that means it becomes a little difficult for us to map it. Now, if I have to do the under story characterization, let us say for medicinal plants, that means I have to have very high resolution data, that is first requirement. I need to also have a very good density map, forest density map. Why? See, there will be many plants which will be growing in open forest areas. See, we say open forest means it is not good, density is not good, wood is not good or, no, it is not like that. There may be few trees, but undergrowth will be very good. The undergrowth, you will have lot of medicinal plants growing in that area. So, if I know that a particular type of medicinal plant grows in open forest, it is boon for me, I will go and do my sampling there. That is why it becomes very important for us to have this thing. So, we can do uh, sampling. I will tell you about the sampling later on. Uh, there are different methods. Normally, people do systematic sampling, but uh, because remote sensing has an advantage uh, over systematic sampling, so we always recommend that we should do the random sampling. And within random sampling, we can go one step further and can do the stratified random sampling. Now, what is this stratification means? So, from remote sensing, I can get vegetation cover type map, one strata. I can get vegetation, let us forest density map, second strata. I can get a physiography map. I can get a soil map from anybody, NBSS or any other source, you can get soil map. In GIS, you can overlay all these maps. So, you, what do you do? You can just overlay. You get one file now, okay? cross, you cross, use the cross operation. What do you learn? you will get the big pop, let us say big polygon, which was forest type A, may have two or three density. That means, now it is divided into three, four density. One density may have on one physiographic unit, another may have different. That means, the all the variability, what we call the climatic variability, which is occurring, where these plants are found, you have captured through a stratified random sampling. Now, we can decide, suppose I have enough money, enough manpower, because uh, you need a full botanist for that actually and we do not have these days. Okay? So, let us say, then what I do? I will then decide, okay, I will do 0 0.001 or 0 0.005 percent of the total forest area, I will do the sampling. Now, the best point what is that? If you have done this thing, you will never miss any habitat. See, if you go from here to Masuri, how do you do the sampling or how you have done the survey? He has also worked, you have also worked. What do we do? We get from in, into a car, a stop here and there, along the roadside, whatever flowering or fruiting plants or any uh, uh, medicinal plants we find, we collect it and bring a, make a herbarium and report to the boss, sir, I have done my work. But that is all everybody has been doing last 100 years. Last 100 years, everybody has been going Delhi, Mas uh, Dehradun, Masuri and coming back and all same plants have been reported again and again and again. So, there is no addition. So, when you use remote sensing, you are getting to know that, oh, oh, beyond this hill or in this valley, you have different type of the tone, different type of the forests, different type of the density. Let me go there and do the sampling or do the inventory, whatever you want to do. So, therefore, this will only, you will come to know once you use the remote sensing data. Let us say, if I see from here, Masuri, I can see only the south face of it. From here, I can say, okay, I will get salt forest, I will get a bonia forest, I will get a pine forest, then I go little bit, I will get a oak forest, I will get a Siddhas Devara forest, that is all. What is this northern side of the Masuri hill? I really do not know. 
So, that advantage comes from the remote sensing. So, once you have a proper sampling done, then you can do all this frequency analysis, because that is very important for you, uh, abundance and then density and rarity, because now we are also talking about the rare, endangered and threatened plants, particularly medicinal plants. A common plants, let us say if uh, lantana camera becomes rare, I have no problem. But if kutki becomes a rare, I have a problem. So, that means I have to focus on those plants which are of uh, having some kind of a threat value. And that is how I have saved here, uh, I have already explained to you this remote sensing will help you to save a lot of time, a lot of money and a lot of manpower and man days. You can do better work. See what is the disadvantage in systematic sampling? In systematic sampling, let us say, I want, do not want to name the organizations, people have a map, they divide the map into grids, maybe half kilometer or one kilometer or five kilometer by five kilometer grid and then they go to the center of each grid, they go and do the sampling, fine, it is good. If your density of the sampling is good, it may be good. But what happens, suppose I am a forester, my objective is to have the sampling done and when I go, it seems that center of that grid is in the water or in the agriculture area or in the wasteland or on the rock. That means, my sampling intensity which I wanted will come down. So, to avoid all these things, let us do all that to be neglected first and then do the uh, sampling. Just to give you an example, I have already told you how this distribution of the vegetation is in Dune Valley because I will give you some examples of the Dune Valley and you had some discussion with the madam about the spectral signature. So, because the spectral signature is the main concern or main uh, you can say the uh, uh, source for us to identify a species. So, let us say this is uh, how you start, you have Surya robusta uh, and now let us say if I say Surya robusta, so sal forest, what, what are the associates of the sal forest? Tell me please. Okay, Rolfia can be there. Okay, what else? See, first associate is the Melotus philippensis. Second is, third is the Clerodendron. Bottom, it's very common. You go here, you go to south, you go to anywhere, you go to Chhattisgarh, you go to Assam, you will get the same species everywhere. So if I tell that, okay, this is a sal forest. If my Clerodendron floribundum is a economically important species, then I know where to go and collect this plant. I do not have to go to teak forest. So, that advantage, that means remote sensing is telling you the address of the plant. You do not have to search. See, what is the use of this geospatial technology? Let us say we have 100 organizations working in our country and everybody is working on biodiversity conservation. Everybody has his own data, nobody shares the data. That means, I am repeating the same thing, same thing again and again last 20, 30 years, but at the same time no progress. So, this once you have the geotag plants and keep on adding and adding and suppose somebody, some biotechnology department comes, uh, that is what has been done in the taxes actually. We got the samples of the taxes bark from the Tali Valley and we got it analyzed in the sea map. And then we also had collected the bark from the western Himalayas and the alkaloids contained in the eastern Himalayas is much better than the western Himalayas. So, that kind of same species different geographical but different compounds. So, that is required. So, that taxonomist should do actually. Taxonomist duty is to identify species, tell the location or forma or varieties or sub varieties of that species and it should be available to me on the website, maybe through a little restricted because pharmaceutical companies should not come to know about it. The moment for, uh, I think this is not very good. Okay, let me start. So, all that red what you see is a sal forest, very simple. So, if I, if I know that this is a sal forest in Dune Valley, all red, red, then I know what kind of species are found there, very simple. And for that, you do not have to do a great research. Already, if you follow the champion in state classification scheme, he has already mentioned top story, what is species, second story, first story, what kind of species are there. So, you do not, you just know the forest type, you can find out the remaining plants actually. So, that is the advantage, you get it. If you look at this is the northern side of it, southern side you see dry deciduous forest. This is a belt of dry deciduous forest. Now, if you go there, you will find some grasses growing, you will find uh, uh, all eulolopsis and uh, what is that uh, shrub, 
जिसके लाल लाल फूल होते हैं वुडफोडिया फ्रूटिकोसा है वुडफोडिया फ्रूटिकोसा यू फाउंड देर सो यू दैट मीन्स यू कैन गेस वाट आई कैन फाइंड देर सिमिलरली यू कम डाउन हियर मिक्सड देन आई नो वाट काइंड ऑफ ऑल स्पीसीज आर ग्रोइंग देयर इफ आई गो लिटिल अप लेट एस ए दिस इज मसूरी रिज हियर देन आई नो दैट आई विल गेट कुर्कस I will get the devdar, and in Kurkas, what kind of species are found? I know it. So even broad forest type map also is good enough for you to find out what kind of species I might expect in that forest type for conservation, and do my inventory. So that is the great advantage what we get from the remote sensing. Look in detail little now. Do I have to tell anything to you? This image is self-explanatory. See based on the color. we call it tone or the texture or you say association or location or shape you yourself can say sir this is this this is this this is this you can at least say this is type 1 this is type 2 this is type 3 even if you do not know the name of it so that means i can go to the field take a gps and can find out that what is this what is this building or this is a road what is this forest type what is this forest type or let us say what is this feature here or what are these features so that means i can immediately make a map so that is the great advantage you get from the remote sensing now let us try to understand what is a species see you are what is your objective your objective is to find out an species isn't it well, any species maybe herb shrub or epiphyte lithophyte whatever it may be now let us try to understand what is a species is any idea can anybody describe what is a species you should tell me you are taxonomist see see that means we need to keep on revising okay once we get a job doesn't mean that we will stop thinking and chali batai bsi ko batana chahiye what is a species no no better hai yeah see you have worked on uh, some you have done some revisionary work ha huh? ha huh, then you should know what is a species what is a family what is a genus species what is a variety ha yeah yeah certainly species is generally the bottom by in every plant uh, has its genus in it no. it's specific no no that is not no, that's not the definition of a species that's not a definition of it you i want a botanical definition not the people who talk about the definition so what is, we are one species Yeah, most likely. Huh? We are one species. All are different. Yeah, different. I don't look like you. You don't look like me. Yeah. That means there is within a species also there is a variability. Uh, you you want to according to variation. Not you only variation. Know, yeah. Not only variation. See, but let us say we have we got married. We have produced children, and we have fertile children produced. So that is the species. That means it is a population or group of plants or a population which can interbreed. and produce fertile progenies then only it is a species otherwise donkey and mule donkey and horse get uh, bre- the, the, you may have the mule out of it but it's infertile actually so that means this is not the same species breeding population yeah so you should have a breeding population okay that is a species actually so for that you have to do what you are not a genetics person you are not studying cytology okay we are basically doing morphological study so based on even morphological study you should be able to compare okay this flower this flower this leaf this leaf is same okay that's how we identify a plant is same so there is no problem so species level we have to do the mapping and what is the challenge for us that we have to discuss of for that first thing is we have to do the ground truth collection that means i go to the field second is that uh, at least you should be develop yourself into a good field botanist normally what we do i have seen you take a local person you pay him some 300 400 rupees and you ask him ha iska naam kya hai he tells something x y z iska naam kya hai he tells something x y z you note down here and you type on the internet and you say khair it tells acacia catechu you convert into botanical name and you publish a report get a promotion that is not the correct approach actually see he will call acacia catechu maybe three species four species he may call one name so a field botanist only can say okay this is one species this is another species 
and I should be able to establish that in the field. Otherwise, whatever amount of your remote sensing GIS or ground truth you do, if you are not able to find out or identify a species in the field itself, at least 80 to 90 percent species to be identified in the field, remaining you can bring here specimens and go to BSI or uh, FRI and try to identify it. So, first requirement you have to be good field botanist, I do not want a taxonomist. Taxonomist goes into the synonymy and all that, that is not required, let us not field botanist, I should know the plant, well, that is all, that is my objective. And then of course, we should be knowing, I think GIS lectures are going to be there. So, you will be able to create spatial as well as non-spatial data. Ours is mostly non-spatial data. Our data, which whatever latitude, longitude I will have from the ground location is a non-spatial data. It is a point. It does not have an area. If it is an area, that means it is a large area, I can say it is a polygon. That is not the situation with forest type map will have a polygon that is a spatial, but this is a non-spatial point information. So, that we have to collect it. And uh, as I said yesterday also during the inauguration, uh, IRS uh, has that kind of expertise as a remote sensing, GIS, GPS as well as this biodiversity. I mean forestry depart ecology department if you happen to visit, uh, we have, we may show you some more case studies on this thing. Okay, now, tell me what is the forest, because we have to start now mapping using remote sensing. So, first thing I should map the forest, second I should map the communities and then I go to the species level. So, let us see what is a forest. Ecosystem, ecosystem is ecosystem, it is a different term. Types of vegetation, Types of vegetation uh, it is either tree, either shrub, either herbs with the combination of the uh, vegetation. Okay. So, almost correct. Okay. Uh, let us say, it, it, uh, uh, normally we say it is a type of vegetation dominated by trees, but uh, in Indian context, anything which is wild, it can be a shrubby vegetation, it can be a herbaceous vegetation, it can be pastures, everything we treat as a forest. forest. Otherwise, botanically, the tree dominated vegetation is the forest. forest. So, we take little, uh, little uh, flexibility in that defining this thing. And, and we have champion state has already defined 221 types of the forest or sub forest types. That means, we have a great variability in the forest types of India, 221. We have done a study on biodiversity characterization. We have been able to do around 121 forest type using satellite data. You cannot do all forest type mapping as per champion and state classification. It is a big challenge. It is a very big challenge actually. Therefore, the best way is to whatever remote sensing gives you take it and then do the field work. Uh, we have around 4 biodiversity hotspots, we have around 10 biogeographical zones, 4 endemic centers and 26 micro endemic centers. So, that itself also indicates the kind of variability and once you talk about kind of variability, immediately the spectral signature variability comes into picture, immediately comes into picture. I do not know whether you know that plant. Uh, forgot the name. This plant is found in tropics as well as in temperate. Missing the, maybe I can remember I will tell you. So, that means such a kind of a ecological resilience it has actually. It is found in the uh, uh, Jharkhand, it is found in the Sikkim in temperate zone also. I think you should be able to tell the name. Uh, no. It has uh, um, what is pan type leaf, no? Chota chota hota hai, chota rough hota hai, dense hota leaf forgot the name. Anyway, check. Now, uh, we talked about the species. How do we define a species? I have already told you and these are based on what? Arrangement of the leaves. From satellite data 800 kilometer, you cannot find out what is the arrangement of the leaves. You cannot do that actually. Similarly, color of the leaves or color of the flower or number of sepals, number of petals or number of anthers or number of locules or is, is it epigamous or apogamous, you cannot do that actually. See our system of classification is so complicated actually. So, a species is a, is a set something which is a, which depends upon inherent character which is which you normally cannot see sometimes even with open eyes actually. You may have to do some kind of dissection and remote sensing does not allow data dissection. So, that means what I am trying to say there are some limitations. So, anatomical characters morphological characters and genetic characters. That is the basis of species 
and sometimes you now we talk about chemotaxonomy and all that. Now tell me, how many species are in the, uh, let us say, let us start with this thing, huh? this one. How many species you expect, I should come this side, more of people are sitting this side. Okay, how many species you expect here? More than seven, sir. Huh? More than seven, eight you can expect. How many species here? I think variety level. Yeah. Variety level. Yeah. So the species could be same, but mm. there is a difference at the variety level. How many here? One, one, one only. But no, everyone different. is different. different. See, appearance, everyone is different, but it is the same species. Yes. Mm. So if you take now, let us say, spectral signature of this will be different from this, this, all six will be different. Mm. So then how do we decide which spectral yes. signature is for rose? It is complicated actually. See how many species here I only gave you, huh? one species, one is each one is different. So mapping is not that easy task actually. Huh? The way we think that okay we can do mapping at a species level, so that is why we have to go into little more detail. You can see here the leaves, shape of the leaves, the crown, the, uh, the shape of the trees, leaves and deciduous condition, uh, uh, let us say leafy condition. So let us say if you take a satellite data of a uh, summer season. Same species will give you different reflectance. Same species you take a data in let us say October, November, growing season, it will be different. Same species. And not only that, if you go to central India, this moist deciduous and dry deciduous forest, if you work there, no, you will find every 15 days the phenology changes. So that means every 15 days you will have a different reflectance. Forest type remains the same, location remains the same, but reflectance keeps on changing. That means if I have to develop a spectral signature library, I should have for each week, each week, each species, each location. That means huge one. That is what Madam was telling, it is not an easy task. And then there are lot of factors which uh, I think I will not be going into much detail because time is not that much. Uh, I have been covering many things here. Okay. I uh, will say there are lot of uh, internal factors, let us say structure of the leaves, age of the forest phenology, pigmentation, see a new leaf is anthocyanin is born, mm. eh? it is uh, purplish in color, eh? after 10, 15 days becomes green, yellow green, then becomes dark green. That means if you have a one time data, anthocyanin is there, you get different reflectance for the same species, same location, after 10 days different spectral signature. So there is a lot of variability there. Uh, moisture content of the leaves, if leaf is under stress, you will get a different reflectance. If moisture is enough, you will get a different kind of. Similarly, sun angle, geometry of the branches and trees, nutritional status, health, ecological adaptation. Thorny species, different. No non-thorny, different. Adaptations. Huh? Thick leaves, different. Similarly, we have lot of exp uh, external factors uh, like uh, atmospheric conditions. Today may be clean, next day may be little hazy there will be a lot of dust particles in there, so we have to do that also. So let us see how it varies, see the leaves, monocot leaves thin, if they, they do not get water in one day, immediately they will wilt away. Huh? You think about this uh, iconia, huh? it is a spongy, different characteristics you will get. If you have a let us say normal leaf, huh? you will have a different kind of a uh, epidermis or uh, colon chyma or palisade tissue or all that lower epidermis, everything is different. You take conifer, very compact, huh? very compact. So that means the reflectance basically what I am trying to say, let us say this is the sun ray coming, it interacts with the leaf of that species, depending upon that type, it will give the bag return. If it is a very turgid, cell is very turgid healthy, mm. good return, mm. bright object. If it is uh, shriveled, mm. that means there is no cell sap, no water, no moisture, mm. that means the all that signal which has gone there, it keeps on interacting lowerly, no reflectance out, it dark in appearance. So that is how the image has to be interpreted. You can see here impact of phenology, let us say this is one <coughs> type of forest here, in the uh, wet season and dry season same forest looks like that. So if, if I have to map, I will be very difficult. Similarly, here you, this is reverse case, okay? This is, this is wet season. Let us say this wet season, can you say anything here? What is here? 
you can see few black black patches but you see dry season i can get clear cut boundary of it this is a khair forest basically it's a khair forest acacia cut you but i can get, similarly you can see sal forest also so differentiation that's why we say the whenever you are doing whenever you go for any survey please choose a appropriate season satellite data season data so that you are able to discriminate all the forest types or vegetation which you are handling let us say what we get at the pixel level hmm? what is a pixel i think something might be knowing no it's an area projected on the ground and then the all the features which are present in that the all the reflectance or photons get integrated get a value called digital number number comes to the computer and we start analyzing but within let us say if you talk about the uh, uh, irs list 3 data 23 and a half meter resolution so 23 half meter means this big that big and very big so it in this you will have around five to six species of trees growing there will be an n number of herbaceous plants growing species going for this what you get you get one number that means you can only say vegetation is there what type of species there that you cannot say so best thing is to have better resolution let us say we say around 10 meter average 10 meter crown diameter good then high spectral resolution hyper spectral she was telling morning mm -hmm. hyper spectral remote sensing is has now new potential for uh, identifying species level now let me tell you how the spectral signature looks like for from species so first one is the sal here so this is the field spectra we have gone to the field and collected the spectra so this is how it appears see this is the red zone this is the infrared and there are some kings this you have to focus on these things you see here this is a teak this is sal so this band this region will help me to identify between teak and sal that's how the spectral signature library has to be generated similarly you can see here the bamboo species two species here you can see acacia araucaria and the pinus two conifer species they are all different so i was telling what you get in a species let's say this is a pixel it can be 250 meter or 30 23 and 1/2 meter within this you get one value but if i take high resolution data let us say 2 and 1/2 meter or 5.8 meter resolution list four data or let us say cartosat data or iconos data i overlay this pixel and i can find within that pixel i get so so much of variability which i am not able to capture if i have a coarse resolution data therefore proper pixel that means proper uh, selection of the satellite data is very important let me give you the hyperspectral okay so we have done the mapping of the uh, using hyperspectral data and you can see here we are able to identify good number like i can say sesam i can say pure teak riverine forest pure sal this is uh, ipomia don't worry about the spelling mm -hmm. and within sal i can see 1 2 3 that means i have a pure sal is 1 but within sal i am able to discriminate even type 1 2 3 now i have to go to the field and find out what is the type 1 2 and 3 maybe age or maybe some infection so that is possible similarly like kanju huh, holoptelia integrifolia for khair jamun yeah. jamun normally doesn't grow gregariously wo ek ek ped hote na nali kinare very narrow but if you have a spectral data you have potential to map it so that means what i'm trying to say uh, when you go for a species level mapping high spatial high spectral resolution data will be very useful if you happen to get it now we have some flights in india we are trying to do that so now uh, let us go into the biodiversity characterization we would like to know what is the condition of my biodiversity where it is found that is thing that i can use gps how much it is there because i am going to do the quantification let us say i use would like to have the some kind of plant developed how to harvest sustainably so i would like to know the area of it what is the variability let us say in terms of chemicals or within the species and what are the threats anthropogenic or over collection or over exploitation all these we have to what desert okay so and this is a acacia plantation you can map it no problem this you can map it no problem because it's a big big patches yeah. no problem this is hippophy in spiti valley in the bottom of river bottom if somebody has gone there this is all hippophy uh, this is also same thing zoomed in hippophy that's how you can uh, map all these things because they are growing in large large patches so you will be able to do that uh, yeah you can see podophyllum podophyllum 
if protophyllum is only one plant here, another plant may be after 500 meter, maybe after 2 kilometers. How do you map it? You can't do it. You have to have a GPS for that matter. Okay? That's how the variability is very high in cold desert. Similarly, in the tropical hot countries also you will have a lot of uh, variability in that. And there is a lot of anthropogenic pressure, but that's what I'm trying to show you here. And similarly for alpine and temperate zone also. We will have different, let us say this is a betula forest. So I know in betula it is forest, what do I have? First canopy is betula it is, second canopy what do I have? Please tell. You get rhododendrons. Yes. You get rhododendron. So I can see here, this is betula it is, the ground canopy is rhododendron. And what kind of rhododendron is there? Is it campanulatum? All that we have to go to the field because this is habitat for the musk deer. So, lot of ground work is also required when you talk about the biodiversity uh, issues here. And lot of anthropogenic pressure, I will not talk about this thing. And lot of people keep collecting and killing animals and all that. Is. Now, what remote sensing gives us? That is important. You see, the, the triangle, this triangle is upward, this triangle is reverse. So, biological organization, let us say, I have left the genetic level. So, gene, genetic, species, population, community, ecosystem, landscape, biomes, and biosphere. So, I can use satellite data, let us say, NOAA, VHR, or MODIS. Regional, I can do MODIS and AVH data, Indian satellite. Landscape level, land, Landsat TM or LIS3. And then ecosystem level, LIS3 and ASTER, even LIS4 also can be used. Community level, I go for LIS4. Very high. I can think about hyperion data, orbit data, cartoset data, iconos data, that kind of very high resolution data. That means there is a relationship, but not so healthy. Okay? And it is not required also. Suppose you want to do a species level, please do not use this data. This data is for global studies. This data, cartoset, is for local studies. You are concerned with the local. So, please focus on that. Yeah, you can see here how the variability is there in the oak forest, in the ulnus forest. And what we want, what is the objective of our use? First is you want to have the repository of the medicinal plants or aromatic plants, that is first. Second is you certainly would like to understand what is the genetic variability of that species, where it is more. That is very important for you to have the population in that area. For that, that means I should have a species diversity let us say x, y, z, and then I should have genetic diversity. That means sub varieties, varieties, forma, races, whether you talk about rice or you talk about uh, any other species or let us say hippophy for that matter. What are the species? So, where I get very high species diversity and I get very genetic, that is the location IUS would like to protect it or IUS would like to recommend to the Ministry of uh, Forest and Environment, please, this area is good for this kind of plant, please try to protect it. So, that is how the uh, study has to be carried out. Now, how do we do this? Normally, trend is we take a sack, eh? what BSI people and taxonomists will agree, we have a sack, whatever we get flowering and fruiting, put it to the bag, come into the lab, make a herbarium, press it, identify, name it, my job is done. That is a trace neural, and everybody goes same, same route, same 100 times, and same species reported. What we say, let us use remote sensing. So, let us say I have a remote sensing. I have a map, maybe at ecosystem level or landscape level, whatever, I have a map. <coughs> map, type map, density map, and I do the stratification, as I explained you earlier. Once I have done the stratification, I know where to go. I have now address of the different habitats. And where habitats will have what? The plants. That means I will be able to nicely do the survey and do the quantification. You, you might have, must have studied phytosociological study, no? Mm -hmm. Abundance. Density, density, IVI, all yeah. that you must have studied, no? That is all possible if you do this kind of thing. And we have a lot of threats. So, let us say here, this is a Pachmodi Biosphere Reserve. You can see these. This is a core area of National Park, but you see a lot of villages are there. Mm -hmm. That means a lot of disturbance is there. And this case yesterday I am showing you. So, just keep it in mind. So, now we go to the biodiversity characterization. This is a Pachmodi Biosphere Reserve. You can see here, this is uh, two sanctuaries, Bori and the Pachmodi sanctuaries. Uh, this is the core area national park and then this is the biosphere reserve area, outside is the biosphere reserve. This is all agriculture here, this is all teak forest, this is salt forest here and this is again dry deciduous forest which is uh, no leaf at this moment. So, let us say what I have done here, I have not done the sampling. So, uh, there is a different form, we, we normally divide, design, a, sorry, design a format, uh, something like that, we lay plots of 0.1 hectare 
or 20 by 20 meter here. And when it, this is for trees, then for 10 by 10 meter for the shrub species and then 1 by 1 for the herbaceous plants. So we count all these species, all the plants. That means now I can do the density and the occurrence, rarity, whatever I want to, I can do. That is a very important for the I used to do that. Plot size, of course, uh, we normally follow a species area curve. Depending upon it, you can have 10 meter by 10 meter. Then you have to take more plots. If you take 0.1 hectare per, you have to take less plots. So depending upon the money, depending upon an object, you can decide about this thing. You can also decide whether you want to have a circular plot, we call it point, or you want to have a square, or you want to have so many plots along a gradient. That is from starting from Dehradun, I want to have 10 or 20 plots up to Masuri, so that I will get capture all the variability of the species or forest type. Any design you can choose, this is up to you depending upon your resources. Another thing which I would recommend you to please, whenever you go for surveys, you should name them or you should number them. Because next time, suppose you go after 10 years, mm -hmm. then how do you know which plant I has observed or had observed? So if you have put tags, so we have put tags here, you see here metal tags. Now if I, this we had put I think 2004 or 5, now I can go there and find out whether that tree is there or not, that species is there or not. Similarly, I can do all for all. This we have been doing it last uh, six, seven years uh, very nicely. Uh, source of disturbance is normally roads, settlement. So we can create a GIS map huh, in the GIS. And then the disturbance, people can go 5 kilometer, 10 kilometer to collect the fuel wood or to fire or to medicinal plants or any kind. Any so the, we can create buffer zone. We call it influence zone. That is done very easily in the GIS. You can do it. So you can create buffers around. That means zone of influence. People from my house or I can go 1 kilometer, 10 kilometer, 20 kilometer. People living in the forest will go hardly half a kilometer because everything is available next door. People living, live, they have to travel 5 kilometer, 10 kilometer to get a wood or whatever. It may be. So this uh, we can do it. Then we can create this kind of disturbance zone map. So this is a road network within the national park. Please remember that uh, Pajmadi Biosphere Reserve, very high density of population, very high density of road network. And there are two wildlife sanctuaries and one national park. So it is a very dangerous situation for us. So what we have done, we have FCC, we have located the areas, we have gone and these are the stars which you see, these are the areas where we have done sampling. And then we have prepared a vegetation type map, simple thing we have started, okay. So you can see here, sal is basically concentrated here. This is again sal patches, then you have dry teak, moist teak and all yellow yellow patches are agriculture. You can see this within the national park, so much of agriculture is going on. It's a very tricky situation actually. Of course, now we had a IFS course last week. And the one gentleman came from MP. He said, now we have more or less removed all the habitation from the forest, so, uh, from the park area. And now let us try to do some ecological classification. So first thing, first source of uh, biodiversity loss is what? Fragmentation. We had, uh, let us say, 5,000 years back, Dehradun, when Dronachar was here, it must have been a very good salt forest. All through the salt forest, 5,000 years back, very few settlements, maybe one or two only. He must have built some roads. His disciples must have come and settled and then did agriculture. And today you see salt forest in the western part, in the Raipur, in the Masuri, the rest center part of it has all agriculture. So this is a fragmentation of salt forest in last 5,000 years or so. This is a basic cause of the loss of the species, any species, medicinal or non-medicinal. So that we have done this exercise and you can see the core area is highly fragmented. That means, because you see, you have seen all the small, small patches of the settlement and the agriculture. So this area is highly fragmented. Only red, sorry, green area, dark green is low fragmentation. That means it is good for conservation. Simple conclusion you can draw uh, from this kind of a map. I would like to know what is the disturbance because it is basically uh, biodiversity loss is because of what? Over exploitation, yes. grazing, or uh, let us say fire. fire. So these are some of the guys. So you can see here because the density of the roads as well as the population inside is so high, and you see most of the park is shown in the red color. That means very high level of disturbance, particularly the core area. The sanctuary is little less, little better, but the core area is highly disturbed. Now, now scenario which please, please keep this thing in mind. I will not change the scenario. So what we have done, we have now calculated the biological richness of that area. 
and for that we have done now the sampling. So I have a species richness, uh, number of species. Uh, I have done the total index value, you know, economic value. That's where the Ayurveda and Siddha comes into. We have made list of the species growing in there. We have consulted all the available literature to us and listed the uses of each species. It's already with us, the database. There may be 10 uses, there may be 20 uses for every one species. Based on the uses, we have given the weights, that means ranking. So let us say, if I have to compare, what is the fodder value, what is the timber value, what is the medicine value, what is the charcoal value, what is the tannin value, all these I can, there are about seven, eight parameters I can find out, okay. So let us say, I have, if I have to compare between neem and lantana, neem, fodder value, little, goats eat it, lantana, nobody eats it, or let us say, gaur, I have seen sometimes eating, okay. Medicine value, neem has, lantana not reported, uh, charcoal, neem is not used because it brings tears to the eyes, whereas uh, lantana is used. So you can make a table, so we have we have a subject experts, particularly botanists and the pharmaceutical people, ethnobotanists basically, they should be able to help us. And then we have the ecosystem uniqueness, another criteria, representativeness, another criteria and endemism. If more endemic species means better for conservation. Similarly, representativeness means what? My own Indian species. The moment I get one lantana camera or one uh, parthenium, it is no more represented. So value is less, less ranking is the same. And then we can say, we have the disturbance index map already I have shown you. And that means all these maps I can overlay in GIS. Ecosystem uniqueness, species richness map, Biodiversity value map comes from here, terrain complexity map comes from the digital elevation model, and then disturbance index comes from here. All these maps I can now overlay in GIS. Mm. Now you see scenario changes. Now it is like this. Now the biological richness map of the Pachmani biosphere is entirely different. What it says? Most of the area is now converted into very high biological richness and high biological richness. So it justifies the current practice of conservation is good. So decision is good. Now you will ask why sir the area was so much fragmented, it was so much disturbed, how come it becomes so important? Huh? You see here core area, even all these uh, brown brown areas, these are the agriculture areas actually basically, but it is showing as the low biological richness. It is supposed to be because it is crop area, but scenario has changed. Let us see why scenario has changed. In this area we have all kinds of medicinal plants economically important plants, endemic plants. Mm -hmm. You have Silotum nudum. I don't know. Have you seen Silotum nudum? Yes. yes. It is there in that area. Angel Teres evicta. Yes, sir. I have it is there in that locality. In the Arunachal Pradesh, yes. of course, it is plenty, yes. but unexpectedly, it is also found here also. Yes. Of it is known there. This, uh, the pit of it is used for heart patients. Local tribes use it, actually. Similarly, it is Sarifa, Lepidogathis for fever and all that you are using very commonly this plant. Fig, all these species are found there. Serratop terrace, is that, people use it as vegetable. That means if I have done the proper inventory in that area, I can find out the number of economically, medicinally or uh, let us say endemism or representativeness, I can find the all these species which are growing in that particular area. When I put all these parameters which I set here, all these parameters when I put it, the situation changes. So that means field work is important. Something you get from remote sensing, fragmentation map you can get from remote sensing, disturbance map also you can get from remote sensing data. But if I have to convert into a biologically rich, I want to say okay this is first, second, third, fourth rank, I have to do the field work. Field work means I have to do some sampling, I have to have a good botanist, I have to do good literature and then do this kind. So this is what we have done in a project called biodiversity characterization uh, for the entire country. So I will just show you now, this is uh, for the entire country vegetation type map. First I showed you a small example, now entire country we have done it, uh, around 110 PIs are involved in this, is huge project actually which we have done and uh, IRS and NRSC because we were part of NRSC earlier, so NRSC and IRS together have done this uh, study. So this is a vegetation type map of the entire country. You can't see the different types, but because it is very small. Then fragmentation. You can see here, Central India fragmentation, particularly let us say Manipur, uh, Nagaland, 
ईस्ट वेस्टर्न गौरव हिल्स त्रिपुरा हाईली डिस्टर्ब अरुणाचल प्रदेश इज स्लाइटली बेटर बिकॉज झूमी कल्टिवेशन इज लेस पॉपुलेशन इज ऑल्सो लेस फॉरेस्ट एरिया इज वेरी हाई सो लेस बट दिस गिव्स इंडिकेशन दैट इवन दी नॉर्थ ईस्ट पार्ट ऑफ दिस अरुणाचल प्रदेश दिस इज चांगलांग एंड तिराब डिस्ट्रिक्ट नो देर इज ए डिस्टर्बेंस हाई लेवल सो दिस इज ए वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इनपुट टू द गवर्नमेंट टू द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ इन्वायर एंड फॉरेस्ट दैट ओके दीज आर द इंडिकेटिव एरियाज लेट मी ट्राई टू डू समथिंग सो दैट्स हाउ वी हैव डन सिमिलरली फॉर द डिस्टर्बेंस and similarly for the biological richness so for entire country this kind of maps are available and if you go to either bis biodiversity information system which we have developed bisindia.org please go you will get all these maps even ibin i think there will be some lecture on ibin indian bioresource information network all these layers are also there available please do use them what i'm trying to say you please don't start from scratch you are not expert in remote sensing so you should take whatever is available to you and start working on it and if you find a mistake you inform sanam singh there is a mistake here we will get it corrected here up in revise the map and upload it again so that's how we can uh, do a good work a uh, lot of uh, this project uh, has lot of uh, applications actually a lot of state uh, demand of, uh, there was lot of uh, demand from the state forest department to share this data so we have given entire data set to each department forest department of each state actually we have given to fsi also you will find on the fsi website also bhuvan also it is there uh, you can do the now how this data is going to be useful that's what i have listed down here so first thing is biodiversity richness characterization for conservation priorities you can find out the disturbance if high disturbance you do something there similarly conservation gap areas conservation gap areas means what let us say if you are working in the Shivaliks. You have a Kalisar Wildlife Sanctuary, a national park. You have Rajaji National Park. Then you have a Corbett National Park. Then you have a Dudwa National Park. Very good representation of the Sal Forest, tropical. Very good, nice. You go up. Nanda Devi is there. Kibber is there. So many are there in alpine and temperate. Look in between. Subtropical, nothing. Even lower temperate, no national park. These are the gaps in our management. So this map will tell you. You overlay the. Uh, national park and the bio, this uh, map on this thing you will know oh, these are the areas these are the representative ecosystems which have not been conserved but have very high medicinal plants in, in that particular area so this is how this data has to be used uh, uh, very important thing is the extension of it let us say i give you very simple example you have gone to raja national park huh? okay good i think i tell dr samir samir to take you there see you go to saranpur you have gone saranpur from here if you go from dehradun to saranpur left side when you enter in the forest area left side is rajaji national park right side is just reserve forest nothing no status no legal status i should say but if you stand in the road on if you look on left side you look on right side you don't find any difference the plant species are same the density is same lower is flora is same number of animals present this side maybe little more than this side that's all but that area is now national park this area is not a national park now if i have to recommend to the government i can always please that see look i have equally good area on the right side why don't you include this also as a part of national park so this kind of extension this kind of extension can be done if you have this kind of information at a national level we have already done it actually first time we have done it uh, it may need some revision because time uh, deforestation or plantation keeps on going but it is worth trying people are using this for uh, biodiversity surveys this is where it comes to you how uh, you, okay you have done revisionary study okay i don't know whether you can do it or not see if you just uh, on gis you just uh, take the location of these plants from where these have been collected plot on the gis you will get a road map because they have been collecting from the road side only so the don't go there you ask your team please no road side collection already hundreds of the people have done go at least 200 500 meters away from the road below or above you will always get something better so even to plan the botanical surveys or geological surveys this maps are very useful actually Uh, for germplasm, people have used for the working plan preparation also, and for germplasm location for bio prospecting. This is again very important for you. 